Hello, everyone, again. Well, I am back from South Carolina, back in Connecticut. Uh, so we're making progress. And, um, and for that reason, I think what we're going to do is uh, rejigger things so that, first of all, we will call this something other than stay at home, even though we might be staying at home a little bit more in some places, uh, and something like in the know uh, uh, with Kathy Wood. So happy to share our thoughts with you. Um, I don't know if it'll be every week. I, I think the the best uh, the the best way for us to communicate is when we feel that the market's missing something, or we feel that in the middle of turmoil, uh, innovation is really taking off, and we want to talk a little bit more about how it's taking off. Uh, so uh, I will follow the format that we followed the last uh, few weeks. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about fiscal policy, monetary policy, uh, the economy, the markets, uh, innovation. Uh, fiscal policy, uh, very interesting this week. Um, I was on a call with uh, Art Laffer, uh, Steve Moore, Steve Forbes. Larry Kudlow was supposed to be on there, but he was held up, uh, I guess, in the president's office, which everyone concluded was a good thing. Uh, President Trump uh, is probably listening to him. Uh, and uh, I found uh, three ideas uh, would certainly resonate with the market. Uh, I think they have an increasing probability of being enacted. Uh, one I've talked about since we began this crisis, I think it's Art Laffer's favorite, uh, favorite uh, stimulus measure, and that would be a payroll tax holiday through the end of the year. Uh, for both employees and employers, so that would uh, that would be a, a big incentive to pull activity into uh, 2020. And so that's the first one you've heard about that. Again, increasing uh, probability. The second one was is full uh, uh, full uh, deduction or expensing of capital expenditures in year one. Uh, so that would get the capital uh, spending cycle going. Capital spending uh, is the highest multiplier activity in the economy, so that would be good. And then the third one I had not heard before, and it probably has the lowest probability of success, but it certainly would fire up uh, the, the equity, well, almost any market, depending upon which, uh, which ones it, it applied to. Uh, and that is a, a payroll tax, I mean, not a payroll tax, a capital gains tax holiday uh, for maybe till year end. But that would also uh, uh, be a tremendous stimulus to not only activity, but to, um, to investment and uh, not just capital spending, but investing in stocks and bonds and maybe real estate. Don't know what it would apply to. Uh, I hadn't heard that one. Uh, it is under consideration. It probably has the lowest uh, chance of success, but uh, I wanted to share it with you anyway. On the monetary side, uh, it looks like uh, the market is very comfortable that uh, Chairman Powell is very uncomfortable. And I, I actually think that's um, that's been one of the reasons the uh, equity markets have continued to defy uh, what many people perceived were the odds and is still moving up. Uh, so we are seeing in the credit markets, if we're looking at uh, signaling here, still discomfort, a bifurcation out uh, in uh, the credit markets. Uh, the uh, credit default swaps for both industrials and consumer discretionary uh, are still uh, showing stresses, strains, um, uncertainty, who's going to make it and who's not. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, we have seen the uh, high yield, uh, the, the high yield rates dropping uh, from 11.7. This would be the average junk bond yield uh, dropping from 11.7 to 7.6%. Uh, uh, so that shows significant progress. But if you look underneath the averages, you find the same kind of bifurcation. Uh, some uh, some uh, bonds have rallied much more than that, and some have hardly rallied at all. 
And of course, uh, industrials includes energy. Um, the oil price has come back up, but I don't think uh, that the markets are trusting um, this move to be sustained. Uh, we've been thinking that we're settling into a new range, the 20 to 40 uh, dollar range. Uh, we're in the middle of that right now. Uh, so, so we shall see. We're also seeing a lot of cracks in the um, uh, co collateralized loan obligation market. This is the market uh, where, where I guess it's an indicator of what's going on in the private equity world more than any other world. That world is very leveraged. And uh, some of these CLO funds, um, well, I guess they were put together uh, carelessly or without uh, regard to risks uh, or sh uh, tests in terms of sh uh, shocking them. So um, we're seeing uh, too much leverage and, um, and some cracks in that market. I think that is uh, relevant mostly to the private equity market. Uh, and so we're not seeing that uh, affecting many other, uh, many other spaces. Uh, what's been remarkable uh, in the last few months is how badly financial stocks have been behaving. And um, I've always looked to financial stocks as an indicator of health in the, in the marketplace. It, it used to be the first sector to turn, and it was used to delivering massive V-shaped recoveries. And uh, yet we're seeing it laboring. In fact, some statistics here, year to date, it's down in the high 20s uh, percent range versus the, the S&P down in the eight to nine percent range. So it's underperformed by almost 2,000 uh, 2, basis points. Um, its rebound has lagged even the energy sector, which is really saying something. And of course, there's a great fear out there of negative interest rates. Uh, Chairman Powell is, uh, and other Fed members are saying they don't want us to go there, and they'd prefer to operate through quantitative easing, which uh, you can do calculations saying for every $800, base, uh, $800 billion of quantitative easing, that's the equivalent of 100 basis points decline in the Fed funds rate. I think they'd prefer to do it that way, and uh, I'll take them at their word. I think that's what they're going to do. Uh, of course, the financials are reflecting the same fear of uh, defaults that we're seeing in certain sectors, and of course, dividend cuts. Um, now, what's interesting is that this is happening uh, despite um, the financial stocks having two times the equities they had going into equity value, they had going into the um, the uh, 08, 09 crisis, and 50% more liquidity. So. Um, one of the best known financial analysts out there, Mike Mayo, um, upgraded a few of the banks uh, this week. Um, as you know, we, uh, we are more focused on the stranded assets uh, that might represent their book value. Uh, Mike Mayo highlights the fact that on average, um, uh, they're at 1.1 times book. We question book. Uh, because there are a lot of uh, stranded assets evolving out there. We certainly see it in any any uh, industry touching the <clears throat> internal combustion engine. Uh, so that, of course, would include autos and auto-related uh, suppliers, air, the airlines, rail. Now, the, the latter two, we think, are going to be hurt during the next five years, uh, disrupted, disintermediated by autonomous vehicles. Autonomous truck platoons, we think, are going to um, enable uh, freight to travel uh, for less per ton mile than rail today. And uh, that has never happened. Uh, trucks have been more expensive, about three times more expensive per uh, ton mile uh, than rails. So 12 cents versus four. Uh, if we're right, if our research on autonomous pl uh, truck platoons is correct, uh, that number is going down to three. So undercutting rail. Rail with roughly $500 billion of assets, uh, could that could become um, a stranded asset. Maybe we'll use it for a high-speed rail for transportation. I don't know now that, we're, uh, now that uh, many people are reticent to take anything uh, that's mass uh, transit. Uh, of course, oil is a big problem for some banks. 
Retail is a big problem for some banks. We're seeing those bankruptcies. And um, financial services generally, we think, are going to be disintermediated by fintech, uh, digital wallets, taking a lot of the most highly profitable businesses away from, from banks and other financial institutions. And I'll get into that a little bit when we get to uh, the innovation part of this. So the economy, uh, V-shape or not. Interestingly, this week, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, no axe to grind, uh, CPO, uh, it, it uh, issued a forecast that the third quarter uh, real GDP would be up 21% at an annual rate. Now that's after a severe drop in the second quarter, but I think uh, many analysts were expecting one, two, three, not much of a recovery at all. Uh, but what I think we're seeing is um, a bit of competition taking place here. States are vying for businesses to come their way. We've heard Georgia, uh, Florida, Texas, Wyoming um, uh, talk this way. And uh, countries are doing the same. So uh, uh, they all risk uh, a, a resurgence of the virus if they don't handle this correctly. Uh, but I do think animal spirits are stirring and that this V-shaped recovery is taking form. Um, we have in uh, a couple of ultra cyclical spaces, some interesting data. Um, if you look at used car sales, now, as I mentioned, used car prices have been collapsing because Hertz and Avis have been selling at distressed prices their cars so that they could satisfy, uh, so they could service their debt. Um, so uh, what we saw was Carvana, uh, which focus, which is focused on, on the uh, used car space online, uh, it, its stock collapsed from roughly 100, a little over 100, to 20 in the space of a few weeks. Now it's back, um, almost back to 100. That's a five, almost a five-fold increase from the bottom. So what's going on there? Well, lower prices are going to move used car sales and or used cars. And we're finding more and more that uh, mass transit, I think a lot of people are going to take their time uh, getting back into those um, uh, mass transit uh, uh, systems. And so uh, uh, used cars are seeing a bit of a, uh, a bit of a burst here, but positively, uh, which uh, will be also supportive for new car sales. Our fear was there would be uh, so much distress in the used car market that it would take away from new car sales. And I'm sure it is, um, but the used car markets are beginning to clear if we're reading uh, that correctly. Um, in the housing space, Redfin uh, just today uh, released a statistic uh, for the week ended uh, uh, May 17th. And uh, they said that the new home purchases, I think that's right, house buying uh, today or during that week was 16.5% higher than it was before the crisis. Now, these days, the spring selling season uh, really gets going in February. And in fact, uh, many people think that uh, I've seen some uh, studies showing that February now is... Um, if it's not the peak, it's tied with uh, March as the peak uh, in terms of home, home buying um, interest in actual transactions. Uh, so that 16.5% from February uh, is saying something. Um, we're hearing, I'm back in Connecticut, this housing market has been dreadful uh, for years. Uh, and uh, we're hearing there are some uh, bidding wars taking place now as families uh, try to relocate as quickly as possible out of New York City. Uh, so big cities uh, probably are in for uh, a bit of a tough time, um, and uh, uh, it will help suburbs. Uh, that is th that is the opposite of what's been happening recently. Uh, so that's that's interesting. The N uh, National Association of Home Builders also said that its index uh, in May. Uh, went up to 37 from 30 in uh, April. So more than a 20% increase month to month. That's not annualized. Uh, so again, very interesting. 
Uh, and we do think housing starts and permits, which uh, for we saw them for April, uh, they were in line with uh, uh, bad expectations, uh, but these are leading indicators that that is going to change. Um, in terms of just a few other uh, points on the markets, I've already given you the credit markets with, uh, with uh, monetary policy. Um, we look at the equity markets, very interesting, the small caps really took off. So remember a few weeks ago, they started up and then they gave back. Uh, so that was disappointing because we really do want to see this bull market broaden out. That is the sign of a, a strengthening bull market, a healthy bull market. Uh, and then uh, small caps gave way. Now they're coming back strongly again. Uh, so so that's, um, that's, that's exciting. Um, on the innovation front, uh, we had at our brainstorm today some uh, interesting, our analyst uh, featured some interesting developments this week. Uh, uh, some of you uh, may have noticed yesterday, I think uh, uh, Facebook announced uh, that it was going to facilitate in-app shopping on all of its platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, powered by Shopify. Uh, and uh, uh, from what our analysts tell me, I'm not on Instagram, but uh, um, I understand that the ad targeting on Instagram is better than any other ad targeting on the internet. And if that's true, uh, it could become uh, quite an interesting shopping, um, uh, shopping experience. Uh, we were talking about uh, Pinterest doing the same thing a couple of weeks ago, and the idea uh, we evolved uh, here is that this is a little bit like the segmentation of the media market in the old days. Uh, and in the old days, you used to have Life magazine or these very big, big, thick magazines, and with time, they segmented out into various interests. Um, so we thought, okay, Pinterest is the equivalent of a magazine in this day and age and, uh, and a, a segmentation strategy for shopping. Uh, but now with this development, Facebook is basically saying, hey, we have the whole magazine rack here. Uh, and uh, they may be doing to Pinterest uh, what they have done to Snap or what they did do to Snap uh, by copying some of their ideas like stories uh, successfully. Another interesting uh, development was uh, Joe Rogan signing up with Spotify. Uh, I guess Spotify is guaranteeing him $100 million over a number of years. Uh, this, uh, this is exciting in one way, uh, certainly for him. Uh, I think uh, many people who were, are not on Spotify and, you know, just like his, liked his free form and you know, not being hostage to any central uh, uh, authority um, are a little bit sad to see this happen. But we're also seeing uh, there's a rush uh, into the podcast space. This week, uh, I think that uh, Amazon announced uh, some podcasting um, uh, ventures through Twitch and through Audible, both of which are its properties. And of course, Apple is lining up some content itself. So it was interesting to watch uh, Spotify not break out uh, on the Joe Rogan news. It went up to its old high. Um, I, I do think uh, it, Spotify is a, a fertile plat platform for podcasts. It's amazing that Apple lost the march on that, and they're going to have to run to catch up. Uh, we also believe that uh, for Spotify, podcasts are going to be much more profitable. They're not hostage to the music labels in the way that music is. So that's good. But there, there is a lot of competition coming in uh, the podcast space. Um, and then uh, on the vaccine front, uh, we've been watching two, well, actually three um, uh, companies in the COVID-19 vaccine space. Moderna is getting a huge amount of publicity. It looks like uh, they're going into a combined phase two, three trial, and it's possible they could have a vaccine by fall. So talk about the genomic revolution. When the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus hit, um, all the experts out there, and, and they are the experts, they were saying, well, we're not going to have a, a vaccine for at least 12 months, but more likely we won't be able to ramp up volumes for 18 months to two years. 
uh, and um, that has proven not to be the case. Uh, these are uh, mRNA uh, um, vaccines. This has never been done before. Uh, and so many people thought it couldn't be done, but this truly is the genomic revolution. You have Illumina DNA sequencing, uh, the, the virus, Illumina's machines, that is, the, the COVID-19 virus. You have TWIST, uh, biosciences, uh, reading the, the genome that Illumina sequences. And then you've got testing companies like Abbott and Dana Herseffiad benefiting from that very quick read. Uh, and now we have uh, vaccines, likely. Uh, Moderna's get, Moderna's getting most of the publicity. Two other names, Arcturus and Innovio, um, uh, are also getting uh, uh, some attention. Uh, Arcturus is also an mRNA company, uh, but a replicating mRNA company. And uh, it looks like their dosing might be just single dose, whereas Moderna will be uh, double dosed, need a booster. Uh, and uh, it will be able to scale from a manufacturing point of view um, much more quickly than Moderna. Uh, so, so that's interesting. We've been watching that one carefully. Uh, same with uh, Inovio. Uh, Inovio is a, a DNA vaccine company. And uh, uh, it is saying it will be ready to go by the end of this year with a million doses. So we'll see. We know the, cap the capital, I think there are a hundred possible, there are a hundred companies developing vaccines now for the COVID-19. So there's just too much capital moving into the space. If these three companies get it right, maybe a few others will benefit, but um, uh, you know, that the, they should allocate their vaccine resources elsewhere, we think. Um, and then uh, just two more in the innovation front. We had, not this week, but uh, last week, uh, I don't think I mentioned it, the Bitcoin halving uh, was successful, open, so open source software update. Uh, and many people worry when there are trans transition points like this. Um, so now the, Bitcoin, the number of Bitcoin being um, issued per year uh, will go up only 1.8% per year. Before this, for the past four years, roughly, it had been nearly 4% uh, per year. And, uh, and in another four years or 210,000 blocks, uh, we'll be down to 0.9% per year. And so what we're going to see here, uh, and, we, and we really do believe this will be the case, is there it will develop scarcity value. Right now we're at about uh, 17 and a half million units uh, of Bitcoin or Bitcoins out there. Um, and uh, we, th that number is mathematically metered to top out at 21 million units. Uh, so we wouldn't be surprised uh, to see the scarcity value enter the conversation. Um, and, and now that the halving has taken place, uh, for institutions uh, to develop more interest in it. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones last week, as I mentioned, uh, has, has probably caused some institutional investors to start doing more homework. Uh, and uh, JP Morgan's decision uh, to support Bitcoin exchanges as well. Um, and so uh, we would not be surprised uh, to see Bitcoin benefiting from more institutional and retail interest. And finally, uh, talking about um, interest in trading Bitcoin or stocks, uh, it's been fascinating to see the surge in trading, in, in stocks especially. Uh, and uh, in our brainstorm uh, today, uh, George Whitridge, one of our uh, fintech analysts, um, uh, highlighted that it could very well be because uh, there haven't been any sports. And those who enjoy betting um, have turned to the stock market. It's quite possible. Um, uh, so uh, we're also seeing it, though, uh, in um, places like Square, uh, Square's Cash App, big surge in volume. Same with Bitcoin trading. Uh, and Robinhood, um, I guess interest rates at zero uh, uh, are pushing individuals and I would say institutions uh, towards bonds, I, I mean, towards stocks away from bonds. 
And I would also say something else is going on here. Uh, in 2008, 2009, the meltdown, when we were wondering if the financial system around the world was going to survive, uh, uh, I know that a lot of, especially retail investors, cashed out in the middle of that crisis. And they've been fearful of getting in ever since. And, and they've watched the market go up tremendously. Um, I think this time around, uh, they're seeing a crisis and saying, okay, I'm not going to make that mistake again. And they may have just tiptoed into the market a bit, um, which is good. We're, we're happy, happy that they're back. And uh, as you know, we're very optimistic uh, about the equity markets. We love the wall of worry that uh, the markets are climbing. And we will continue to have walls of worry, whether it's the recurrence of the virus or now, once again, the Hong Kong, China uh, uh, protests uh, and the US China trade talks. Uh, there's always something to worry about. Um, but we think that this crisis is actually going to increase the productivity of this economy. The digital world has gotten an incredible boost, booster shot here. We are, and we hear companies saying this all the time, uh, we are pulling what they thought was going to be three years of activity potentially into one year. And all of these technologies, every technology that um, uh, around which we center our research, uh, will result in productivity surges, which should result, uh, among other things, in um, wealth creation. If we get any of these three fiscal policy measures that I mentioned at the beginning, the payroll tax holiday, uh, the 100% uh, percent expensing of capital expenditures, and oh my goodness, the, uh, the holiday, be it three, six months from capital gains tax rates, if we invest in that period, uh, then uh, and 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 we would never have to pay capital gains taxes if I understand what they're saying correctly on those on those investments. Uh, so that would encourage long term uh, holdings of shares, which we also think is a very good thing. So. Um, with that, uh, I hope it's going to be a beautiful weekend for everyone around the country. It's a long weekend. Um, uh, we give our thanks and, uh, and we honor our veterans this Memorial Day. Um, freedom is an incredible thing and uh, we in the United States are so lucky to have it. So with that, I wish you all a wonderful uh, long weekend.